So I, I did a lot of my growing up in the 80s, and in the 80s, if you remember, the Los Angeles Lakers were the team of the 80s, right? They won in 80, they won the championship in 80, 82, 85, 87, 88, and I'm an Angelino, so when the Lakers win, we watch the parade and the festivities afterwards, and I remember, I, I think it was in 1988, seeing James Worthy up there, seeing Magic Johnson, seeing A.C. Green, seeing Michael Cooper, Byron Scott, you know, all of them. And then as we were watching, my friends were all gathered around the TV, we were watching the float go down, and we see this curly-haired Mexican guy. I, anybody remember that? I'm, jo I'm joking, of course you remember that. This curly-haired Mexican guy, and we're like, that looks like Dave. Our friend Dave. So we all pull in and we go, that's Dave on the float. How did Dave get on the float? Because I didn't see him shoot any balls during the game. I haven't seen him during the season. How did Dave get access to ride on the victory float to celebrate the world championship LA Lakers? Dave was uh, one of the best friends of A.C. Green. And he had access because A.C. Green invited him to be on that float. And Dave was just bold enough to take the invitation. <laughs> how many of you would have taken the invitation? I'm like, yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, and he was like, this is how we knew it was him. He was doing what he normally does. He's just shouting, you know, cheering with everybody. You ever been in a situation where you have access to something, not because of you, but because of relationship with somebody who does? A different type of access to just kind of summarize where we've been, we're in a series called Set Apart, and in this series called Set Apart, we've talked about the fact that God alone is the unique and only author, creator, and sustainer of all of life. That makes Him holy. He is set apart from any other being on the face, any other entity, any other thing. There is nobody, no one like Him. And he is the one who alone is the source of all holiness. So whatever he creates, he gives life to. It has his holiness. And when God he created you and I to be, and listen to this because this is going to be our thread through the thing. He created us to be a royal, holy priesthood to God. We were created, human beings, Adam and Eve were created to be set apart to represent God in the earth and to rule with God over the earth. That's what we were created to be, is a royal, holy priesthood of people who are under God's care and loving supervision. That's what we were meant to be. But shortly after God created this perfect environment, this holy environment, and set them in as royal priests, everything kind of went undone. And what happened was Eve had a conversation with the snake in a garden, and in that conversation, she was deceived, she was tempted, and she gave in, and she rebelled against God. She was told a lie that her, somehow her life would be better if she went away from God than if she stayed with God, and so she did, and so did Adam. And because they both went away, they rebelled against God, and in that moment, they cut themselves off from relationship with God. They lost everything that God had given them, and they forfeited their calling as a royal priesthood to God. But in that moment, when they tried to cover over their sin and the shame of their sin, God provides a sacrificial animal to cover them from their nakedness and from their shame. And Chris talked about that last week. So if you didn't hear last week, you're going to want to go back. But God comes in this moment, and he comes not just to judge, but he comes to make a promise. And so here's what happens in Genesis 3, 14, 15. So the Lord God, he said to the serpent, because you have done this, because you tempted and deceived them, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And then here's the promise. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. There's going to be hostility between you and the woman. And between your offspring and hers. And he, the offspring of the woman, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So even in this moment where God's royal priesthood rebels against him and they lose their calling, God promises that one day he will send one who will crush the head of the deceiver. He will send one who will crush the head of the one that tempted them. He will send one who will crush and destroy evil and himself intervene on their behalf to restore them to their royal priesthood. 
and to make a way for them to be uh, access, to have access to God once again. One day they would come. And throughout the Bible, we, we read stories about people. And here in the others, the stories of others, we hear this, this thread throughout the Bible. I mean, when you read through this Bible, you will hear about kings like Solomon and David who were meant to rule and to reign and in many ways did rule and reign as God would rule and reign over the earth. And we read stories about prophets like um, Elijah and like Samuel who were meant to receive the word of God and give the word of God, the truth of God to a people who were living in rebellion to God. And we hear about priests. Priests like Aaron and priests like Moses and priests like others who were meant to bring and minister the presence of God to the people and were meant to bring the people to God through sacrifice, preparing them to be able to go into the presence of God, giving them access through sacrifice and through intercession, being able to go into the presence of God at least temporarily. But in each one of these stories, you, you kind of get a, a mixed sense. You get a sense like this feels like it. But this is not it. And the reason why it's not it is because each one of these priests, prophets, and kings, they just failed miserably. And when you look at the, the list of kings of Israel, there were some good kings, but even the good kings had deep flaws in their lives. Most of the kings were evil, though. They were corrupt. They were oppressive. They, they basically not only, you know, endorsed injustice, but they were perpetrators of it as well for their own means. They were just wicked, evil kings. There were these prophets, and, and oftentimes there were some good prophets, but even many of the, the good prophets would be tempted to prophesy for their own gain. Many of the prophets would use the word of God for their own gain, and they would say things that God hadn't said or say things that they felt like the people wanted to hear rather than what God was really saying. And then there were these priests, and the priests, in many cases, they were corrupt priests. They were unjust priests. There were priests that not only led people away from God, but they led people to oftentimes worship the gods of the nations that they were in. And in the midst of all that, God had made this promise. One day, I will send the perfect king, I will send the perfect prophet, I will send the perfect priest. And this perfect king, prophet, and priest, he will crush the head of the serpent. He will destroy evil and he will intervene on your behalf so that you can have access once again to God and so that you can once again be the kingdom of priests and prophets that I've created you to be and you can give God to the world like you were meant to give. And in Hebrews chapter 7, we read about this. And so if you have your Bible, open your Bible with me in Hebrews chapter 7. And Hebrews chapter 7 has some difficult things, but I'm going to hopefully, and together we're hopefully going to get some context for what is being said here. This is how Hebrews chapter 7 reads in verse 22. This is God's word. This makes Jesus the guarantor. And in this that he's referring to is a promise that God has made. A promise that God has made, an oath that God has made, makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant or a better agreement, a better partnership between man and God. The former priests were many in number, and the reason why they were many in number is because they died. They were prevented from death by continuing in the office. But he, talking about Jesus, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost, or he's able to save completely those who draw near or come near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Verse 26, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. He's holy, he's innocent, he's unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those other priests to offer daily sacrifices, first for their own sins, and then for the sins of the people, since he did this one time, once for all, when he offered up the best sacrifice himself. Verse 28, for the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, but the promise that God made, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Has been made perfect forever. God gave to you and I a perfect priest so that we as sinful people could have access to boldly come before the presence of a holy God and so that we as a kingdom of priests could give God to the world once again. You pray with me this morning, Father, we pray that you would help us to understand that Jesus is our perfect priest. 
And Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to be able to understand what that means for us. What does that mean for us that you gave Jesus as a perfect priest? We thank you for it today. Change our hearts, change our minds in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. 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 So priest, when, when, I, when I say the word priest, a lot of different things come to our mind, right? Um, depends on what your tradition is. When I think of a priest, I, I did not grow up in a, in a real formal tradition, so, but I, I've seen movies. So my idea of a priest is a guy who wears a big hat, and he comes with a robe on, and he does certain type of behaviors and different things like that. I don't know what your idea is. Maybe your idea is somebody who is in a, in a room next to you and you confess your sins and somehow they go and they tell God and then comes back with an answer and makes everything okay. That's kind of the idea, maybe some of the ideas or maybe it's something else. But the idea of a priest is somebody who goes between God and man. It's a go-between. It's a mediator. It's somebody who goes between a holy God and unholy people. And he goes between a holy God and unholy people, and with the holy God, he brings the will and the presence of the holy God into connection with unholy people. And with unholy people, he intercedes for them, oftentimes providing a sacrifice so that we have access into the presence of a holy God. So by intercession and prayer, the priest would oftentimes represent God and the people of God to God, and their needs to God, and he would go between God and men, and God men, God men. So why do we need a priest? The reason why we need a priest is because God has created a system whereby you and I can actually have a relationship and be in the presence of a holy God. And because we're sinful, because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, because all of us have failed in one way or another, because we are unholy and unclean, We need to worship God through a priest. That's how God set it up. Some of you are going, well, I don't feel like that. Why do I need it? Because God set it up that way. And I I can explain it to you, but you know what that does tell us? It tells us that God wants us to worship him on his terms, not on our own terms. Right? Most most of the time we're like, God, you know, I'll I'll do the way I want to do. Pick a little bit of this, pick a little. And God goes, I'm God. If you don't understand, it's okay. You still worship me the way that I want you to worship me. And so God sent us a holy, perfect priest so that we could worship God. Because here's the reality. The reality is because of our sin, we are separated from God. We are cut off. We are alienated from God. We don't have access to a holy God on our own. And so the priest that we worship through, he provides the access that we do not have on our own. And so Jesus is the perfect priest that God sends for you and I so that we could have access to the presence of God. Now, here's the problem as we just read in that scripture. The problem with the priests and the sacrifices of old were twofold for the priests. Number one is they all die. And number two, they all have sin. So number one, they all die. I mean, even the greatest, most, you know, close to God, leaders of their day, the people who would offer the sacrifice to God and mediate between the people, they died. So their leadership and their priesthood and their ability to create the access to God died when they died. They were limited in their ability to do that. It was all just temporary. And the second thing is they, they had sin. I mean, even the best of them, they had sin. They were deeply flawed human beings, which means that they had to go and offer sacrifice, not just for the people, but they had to offer sacrifice first for themselves, then for the people. So they died. Their, their priesthood was only temporary. And number two, their sacrifice was not just for the people. It was for themselves, too, because they as well were sinners. Now, the animals, they all died, too. So just think with me about this kind of a system. This is a totally unsustainable system, right? Because they were sacrificing animals, not for the animal's sin, but for their sin. Now put your life into this context. How, How big of a ranch would you need to be able to cover your sin so that you could have access to God? Honestly, I would have to carry animals on me. 
a daily, weekly, monthly. They were making sacrifices, as Chris preached about last weekend, and annually, just in case they missed anything throughout the year or somebody did not make a sacrifice for their sin, they had the Day of Atonement where all the sins of all the people were put on two goats, and the priest would go in with a bull for his own sin, and then two goats for the sins of the people, just in case we missed anything, so that we could have temporary access to the presence of God. Temporary because all it did was cover our sin for the moment but then we would do it again because we're sinners. And the priest was a sinner as well. And the animals were dying and dying. How many, how many, I want to say thousands, but how many millions of animals would have died in the course? So God says, I have something way better than that. I'm going to give you a perfect priest who will do what nobody else can do. And this is what he promised from the beginning. So this is what it says in verse 22. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. For the law appoints men with their weaknesses as high priests. But the word of the oath which, got, which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Jesus is unlike any other priest that has ever come or that will ever come. Now, If you know, maybe you've read a little bit of Bible, you know that like the first guy that seems to be a priest in the Bible is this guy named Aaron, and he was the brother-in-law of Moses. And then after that, Moses, it gives to the people the command of God that the priesthood would come through, the ones who would mediate between God and men, they would come from the Levites or the line of the Levites. So all the family of the Levites, based upon your lineage and based upon the law of Moses, you would become a priest of some sort. But there is this one priest that is mentioned in the book of Genesis. His name is Melchizedek. It's only mentioned in Genesis, and it's only mentioned in Psalm 110, and then it's only mentioned now in the New Testament. And there's a parallel that's made between this priest and Jesus. And so here's what actually happens. Abraham goes out to battle against five kings to get back his his nephew Lot, because his nephew Lot was kidnapped and all their property was taken. And Abraham and his men, they have a victory over these five kings. And as they're coming back, they go through a town called Salem, which is Shalom, which is peace, which is the precursor to the word Jerusalem. And this king priest comes out, and his name is Melchizedek. We're not told where he's from. We're not told how he gets there. But somehow Abraham acknowledges his royal priesthood. And Abraham comes and bows before him and receives blessing from this priest. Not only does he receive blessing from this priest, but he gives to this priest a tenth of everything that he's taken. He gives the the priest a tithe. Before there is a tithe, before there is a law, before there is a priesthood, there is Melchizedek who is appointed as priest, not because of a lineage, not because of a law, not because of anything that man has to do with it, but because God has set him as a priest of peace. And God says about Jesus, it's the same thing with Jesus. He's not a priest because he's of the lineage of the, Her- of the Levites. He's not a priest because of the Mosaic law. He's not a priest because of anything he's done. He's a priest because of who he is. And I've appointed him as priest. This is my chosen one. This is the one that I've chosen. Not based upon any qualifications of man, but based upon who he is. There is no other priest like him. And so as we read on about no other priest like him, this is what it says. For the former priests were many in number, because they were prevented from death by continuing in the office. But Jesus, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, He is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is unlike any other priest because he lives forever. His priesthood never runs out. He is eternal. He was the son of man, completely, fully human, and he is also the son of God, fully divine, fully God himself. He was able to die on a cross in our place to pay the price for our sins. It was not an illusion. As a man, he actually died on the cross. But as the Son of God, you can't put to death the Son of God. So he died for our sins, but he three days later rose from the dead because you can't put to death the Son of God. 
And so he lives forever. And he never stops being a priest for you and I. The sacrifice that he offers, it is eternal. The forgiveness that he provides, it is good yesterday, it is good today, and it will be good tomorrow. Not because of the sacrifice, but because of God who sent Jesus who was the sacrifice. The intercession that he makes for you and I, he says, it is forever. I forever live to intercede on your behalf. Forever. God is interceding between you and the Heavenly Father on his behalf. Why? Because his ministry didn't die with him. He is eternal. His ministry lives on forever. And also, Jesus is unlike any other priest because he is, everybody say it with me, perfect. perfect. I, I, I know, it was really awkward the way that I did that, wasn't it? He is perfect. Perfect. Yeah, we don't really even have a concept of what that means. But he was tempted in every way that you and I were, but he didn't give in to any one of those temptations. He was completely without sin. He was completely in the purest essence of the word, holy as a human being. He walked in relationship with God. He was obedient to God. He did everything the Father wanted him to do. He even set aside his greatest desire so that he could fulfill, the, fulfill God's desire. He was completely obedient. He was a perfect high priest who was holy and perfectly sinless. Which means that when he offered himself, he didn't offer an offering just to pay the price for what he deserved. He offered something that he didn't deserve. He paid the price for what we deserve. And he died on the cross in our place to pay the price for our sins. He is perfectly holy. And we see it in Jesus' life. The priests back in their day, they had a ritual because they were supposed to minister between God and people. In order to go into the presence of God, they had to be at least ceremonially clean. So they were very ceremonially aware. They would do washing rituals before ministering before the people and before God. And they had to clean, even clean their garments. So typically, they did not go near people who were diseased. They did not go... who near people who were dead. They did not go near things that would be considered unholy or unclean because they, their thinking was, and this was the way that it was, that uncleanliness would be imparted to them and they would become unclean and then they wouldn't be able to minister in the presence of God or before the people. Jesus, however, he broke all of that because he had no sin and the power of his holiness would cause a sick person to be made well. And the power of his holiness would be, cause those who were sinning and, and needed forgiveness to be forgiven. And the power of his holiness would cause those who were diseased to be healed on the spot. And the power of his holiness was imparted to the people who were sick. It was just the opposite of the priest. Because there is no other priest like him. He is perfectly holy and there is power in his holiness to make things that are unclean, to make things that are diseased, to make things that are sick and dead even come back to life. There is no other priest like Jesus. And there's no other priest like Jesus because the perfect priest that God gives, he makes a perfect sacrifice for you and I. He makes the perfect sacrifice for you and I. He is the just substitute, the sufficient substitute for you and I. There is no other. There is nothing else that can be added to what Jesus Christ has done. All the other substitutes were animals that died on our behalf human beings that were flawed and sinful on our behalf. He is the perfect, eternal high priest who doesn't just administer the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. He made the sacrifice, but the sacrifice was himself. And so this is what it says in, in Hebrews 7. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He did this once for all, when he offered up himself. So like, th this is what this means. This means that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you have one and the one and only Savior of the world. We have the one and only Lord. 
We have the one and only bread of life. We have the one and only door. We have the one and only good shepherd. We have the one and only light of the world. We have the one and only way, truth, and the life. We have the one and only resurrection and life. We have the one and only lion from the tribe of Judah who is victorious. We have the one and only lamb of God who is worthy to offer himself as a sufficient sacrifice in our place for our sins. He is the only one. We have the only one who is the mediator between us and God and who is worthy. If we have the high priest in our life, then we have the only one who can sufficiently mediate between us and God and offer to you and for you and I a sacrifice that is worthy. We have the only one. Okay, so great. So what does that mean? Right? I mean, that's, that's, that's great backstory, but what does that mean? It means that one of the biggest things that you and I as, as human beings deal with, God dealt with for us. It's shame. Right? It's shame. And, and we know shame is a big thing because a woman named Brene Brown wrote a book called Daring Greatly, and that book has sold millions of copies. In fact, you can watch her special on Netflix right now. She is a shame researcher, talks about the effect of shame on our lives. Shame. And some of you go, like, I ain't got shame. If you have sin in your life, you have shame. Even if you don't know, it is working in your life to bridge, to break the bridge between you and God, to break your relationship with other people, to destroy even your relationship with yourself. It erodes our confidence. Shame, the reality, that guilt of our sin exists in us. Shame. And, th this, and, and th this is why sin is so, it is so, I can't use the word because if I say it, it, it will be bad. Sin stinks. Sin, because here, doesn't sin do this? Sin does. Do it. Do it. Do it. Just do it. Do it. You like it if you do it. So what do we do? We do it. <laughs> and then immediately sin comes and goes, I can't believe you did that. I, I can't. I can't. There's no way that God can love you. I can't believe that you did that. It tempts us, and then as soon as we give in to the temptation, it shames us. Wow. That is the one-two punch of the devil. He's going to tempt, 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 and when you give in to temptation, it's going to go, oh, I can't believe you did that. You're such a loser. You're such a failure. You're not enough. You're not enough. And it must be working pretty well for him because he hasn't changed his strategy for all these years. How many of you can identify with the strategy in your life? Anybody? Some of you are just powerful. He tempts, and then he shames. But in Christ, you have a perfect priest. A perfect priest who bore all of your shame so that you wouldn't have to. In Christ, you have a perfect priest. So when the enemy comes, and when the devil comes, and when Satan comes, when the accuser comes, when the deceiver comes to say, you know what, you're not enough. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You haven't done enough. You'll never be enough. You're not enough. You know what you can say? You're right. I'm not enough. And I never will be enough. But I have one in my life who's more than enough. And because of him then I am and will be what I cannot be on my own. You are more than enough when the perfect high priest is in your life. The only way for you and I to live free from the shame of our sin, from the shame of sin that other people have done to us, from the shame of things that we haven't done that we know we should have done, the only way for us to live from the perpetual onslaught of shame that we fall short again and again and again is to have the perfect high priest in our life. Without the perfect high priest in our life, there is no freedom from shame. There's nothing you can do. There's not enough times you can look in a mirror and tell yourself how great you are or do good works to make up for whatever you've done or haven't done or what somebody else did to you. But there is one thing that can make up for the shame, and it's the one who bore your shame on a cross in, his pla in our place. That's the only thing. So the perfect high priest is the only way. Having him in our life is the only way that we can be free from shame. But this just isn't just about us. It isn't just about us. Why? Why is this true? Why is this so? Why did God give us a perfect high priest? So in Hebrews, we're going to jump over to Hebrews 10. Here's why God gave us a high priest. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way opened up for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, here's verse 22. Here's his invitation. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. Let us come near to God. Let us approach him. God gave you and I a perfect priest so that we as sinful people can have confidence to access and to approach the presence of a holy God. He invites us to come with confidence and draw near with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So the the truth and the reality is that none of us deserve to be in the presence of God. None of us have done anything to merit being in the presence of God. But Christ came as our perfect priest, eternal and sinless, and then offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice. He is the perfect priest and the ultimate sacrifice. And he did all of that so you and I could be made holy and righteous and cleansed from our sin so that we could be brought into and invited to come into the presence and access the presence of God. That is so amazing. And many of us, unfortunately, we live forgiven and we live free from the condemnation of our shame, but we fail to enter into the presence of God. We ignore His invitation to access the presence of God and to approach Him. And one of the reasons why I think we ignore it is because we feel like I have to get things together and make my life right before I can come into the presence of God. Look, if if you're thinking that, which I think is a common thinking, I used to think that as well, after I get some stuff straightened out relationally, after I get some stuff straightened out with some sin that I'm struggling with, then I will be acceptable to come into the presence of God. And Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for you and I. You can't add to perfection. If, if I brought the Mona Lisa up and you go, you know what? I think I can make it better. And you put any paint on the Mona Lisa, you would only mess up what is already perfect. When we try and add to what Jesus Christ has already done for us as our perfect high priest, we only mess up what Jesus Christ has already done for us. You can't add anything to what Christ has done for you. So Jesus says, come to me. Just come to me. And you don't have to come through somebody else, or you don't have to come through a mediator other than Jesus Christ. You you get the invitation to come on your own. I I know a lot of times I think we want to go through somebody else. Like, you look at whoever sings up here, you know, Jason on the keyboard, and you're going like, man, if I had a relationship with God like Jason had, then maybe I could access God. So maybe what I should do is I should pray to Jason, pray, I pray to God through Jason. Jason, will you pray for me? You know what Jason's going to tell you? We serve the same God. And just the same access that he gave me, you have that same access. You don't have to go through me. I'll agree with you, but the same Holy Spirit that lives inside of me is the same Holy Spirit that can live inside of you if you receive the great high priest into your life. We don't go to God through another me. I don't go to God through a priest. I don't go, go to God through somebody who I deem as more spiritually mature. I don't go to God through anybody else but Jesus Christ. You have been invited to have a daily access to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, not based on anything that you've done, but based on everything that he is and that he's done for you and I. Yeah. So why would you not take that? Why would you not after this service, why would you not tomorrow morning when you get up, why would you not as you walk throughout your day just go, God, you said you'd be here and that I could come. I'm here. I'm here. You said me, but I don't feel like it. I know. But he did for you what you don't feel like. And then the second thing is this. God gave you and I a perfect priest so that we as a kingdom of priests could give God to the world that we live in. God made this promise to Moses, Exodus chapter uh, 19, verse 6. He says, the word of God says, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
These are the words you're to speak to Israel. Moses was given these words. There will be a day when they will once again be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then in 1 Peter, Peter picks up on this. He says, but you now in Christ, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Just say that with me. I am a royal priesthood. If, if you belong to Christ, this is what Christ says about you and I, that you and I are part of a royal priesthood. We are meant to be ministers to God and ministers of God to the world that we live in. Every member of a church is meant to be a missionary. Every disciple is meant to be a disciple maker. Every person that puts their faith in Jesus Christ is meant to be part of a royal priesthood giving God to the world that we live in. Not because we've somehow earned it, but because he provided the way for it through his perfect priesthood. You are called to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession so that, and here's the, the promise, the promise is not just for us, it is so that you may declare the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's part of what it means to be in Christ, to be a follower of Christ. It is to be a part of a royal priesthood that God promised he would do, he would build, he would restore us to. Well, some of you are going like, but, you know, I didn't choose this. But if you chose Christ, God chose you. He chose you. But I'm not really feeling like a royal priesthood. You know, feelings are only good to tell you how you feel. That's all they are. But the Word of God tells us what is true. And the Word of God tells us that God chooses us to be His royal priesthood so that we may, in this world, give God to the world and we may declare the excellences of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And I... I, I I believe that right now we are in a time where there is an openness of heart to hear the name of Jesus and the good news of Jesus Christ. You and I are called to be people because, remember, we were alienated from God and through his priesthood, he brought us back into relationship with him and gave us access to him. And it wasn't just for us. It was so that we could now go and be priests in the world. Our world needs priests. Our world needs people who will give God to the dark places of the world, to the places where sin is destroying people's lives, to the places where there's corruption and oppression and there's violence and there are chaos and there's people who are at odds with one another. Our world is in a place where we need priests. And they may not say those words, but that is the truth and it's been the truth forever. We needed a priest so God gave us himself and our world needs priests so God gives the world, you and I, to give the world Jesus. And I, I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to, wherever you're at this morning, God has so much more for you and I. And he, he wants to stir a boldness inside of you and I and a courage inside of you and I to live in a way that not only pleases him, but to share our faith in Jesus Christ because the gospel really is the power of God. This is not, Greg, can, you know, are you telling me I need to convince somebody of Jesus? No, I'm just telling you to tell somebody about Jesus and let Jesus convince somebody about Jesus. Yeah. Jesus changes people's lives, not you. But you and I are royal priests. How is anybody going to know if we don't say? How is Midpack going to know unless a middle schooler at Midpack comes to our Friday night? and gives his life to Jesus and begins meeting with Sean Castro and they begin going through this thing we call one-to-one. -one. This is the foundations of the Bible. And he begins learning about how much Jesus loved them so much so that he gave his life on a cross and he died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again from the dead because he is the Son of God. And he said, if you repent of your sins and believe in me, then I will forgive you and give you the gift of salvation. And he didn't go, oh, okay, that sounds like a good deal. He said, oh my gosh, God did that for me. Sean, can we do one of these at Midpack? And so they go and they start one of these at Midpack, and 20 plus students come to Midpack now every week, every week to this small group. Now they have even a smaller group where they get together and again, they do one to one. They learn the basics of Christ. What happens if we don't go to the University of Hawaii? What happens if we don't go to the football team? What happens if we don't say, Jesus Christ? 
is the one who can remove the shame and guilt and sin that we live in. What happens is people's lives don't get changed, but a handful of them heard that message and they got changed and they said, you know what, will you come to the locker room and share this with the locker room? So we go to the locker room every week. We have like 20 plus people that show up there in the locker room. Last week, 20 of them prayed to receive Christ. Seven of them for the first time. I asked them, if you're serious about this, if you prayed it for the first time, how many of you prayed it for the first time? Everybody open your eyes, look around. Seven guys kept their hand up. And then guys were looking around. You go, you go pray with them. That was the beauty. Not that just somebody just had an encounter with Christ, but somebody else said, I'm going to be a royal priest for you, and I'm going to help you walk with God in your relationship with Christ. What happens in our small groups if we don't share the name of Jesus? Then a guy who works with us, who's going through a difficult time, won't come to a prayer meeting and then won't come to our small group. And then when he comes to our small group, he's not going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he hears the gospel of Jesus Christ and tears begin to flow and he goes, that's what I need, that's why I'm here. And he gives his life to Jesus Christ. That doesn't happen unless we go as royal priests. You are a royal priest if you are in Christ Jesus. And it's not because of you. It's because of the royal priest that was given for you and I. And it's because his spirit works in and through our lives. So we trust him. And we go. And we give God to a world that needs to know that there is a God who loves us so much. That he died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. And he's alive forevermore now. He is our perfect priest who gives us access to only come to the presence of God. And he also gives us the capacity to be able to give God to the world. Man, that's good news, isn't it? Pray with me this morning. Father, we are so grateful. Lord, so grateful that you fulfilled your promise and you sent one who would crush the head of the servant, the deceiver. Lord, you sent one who would deliver us from evil, Lord, and would intervene on our behalf so that you could restore us to our royal priesthood. You sent one who is a perfect priest. And Lord, who offered the perfect sacrifice through his own body by shedding his own blood. And Lord, I thank you that you did that because you love us so much. I want to pray for those of you with our eyes closed and our heads bowed this morning. You're just carrying shame. You've tried a lot of things to remove it. What does that shame feel like? It feels like insecurity. It feels like a lack of confidence. It feels like the voice of the enemy perpetually berating you, telling you you're not enough. And if you would just be bold enough today, if you say, you know what, Greg, I'm going to surrender my life to the only one who can take care of shame, the perfect priest, Jesus. And that's you today. I want to pray with you. Can you just lift your hands and say, that's me. That's me, Greg. Anybody at all? Thank you, Lord. Father, we cry out to you, Lord, those who raise their hand, those who have not, Lord, we cry out to you. Father, we give you our life and we put our trust and our hope in you, Lord, our perfect priest. I pray, God, that you would cleanse us from the guilt of our shame. Lord, I pray that you would cleanse us from the stain of sin that exists over our life. Cleanse us, Jesus. You're the only one who can. Lord, you're the only one who can. You are the perfect priest made the perfect sacrifice so that we trust in you. We thank you, Lord. Can you ask him just, Lord, Lord Jesus, be the light of my life. Be the way, the truth, and the life for me. Lord, be my salvation. Lord, in you, I'm putting all of my hope. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us with your spirit, Lord, to live with confidence, to enter boldly into your presence because you invite us to. I want to pray for us as well that God would give us his strength and his spirit so that we can, with great confidence and boldness, 
declare the name of Jesus to the places where there is darkness and Jesus' name needs to be declared. So, Father, you know where you've placed us already. Lord, in our workplaces, there's misery, there's depression, there's hopelessness. Lord, in the schools, there's misery. Lord, there's sin. Some people are so addicted to things right now. These young people, they have no idea how to get out of them. Jesus, there's places of darkness. And we pray, God, that you would strengthen us with faith to be able to go to those places and to tell people about the light that has come into the world. If that's you and your prayers, God, I pray that you would, by your spirit, you would strengthen me with courage to be able to be a royal priest and to declare your name to the people that need so desperately to hear your name. Can you just lift your hand this morning? We're just crying out for the Holy Spirit to freshen us. Lord, I pray for your fresh strength, God, for fresh boldness. Lord, for fresh courage to be able to declare the name of Jesus. Lord, to be able to go to the places where darkness exists and to know with confidence that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, it is the power of God to save a person, to save a situation, Lord, and there is no other. Father, I pray that as we go that you would do miracles, that you would do signs, that you would do wonders through our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, that you would bring revival in our state, in our city, in our workplace, in our schools, amongst the people that we know, Lord, bring revival as we speak the name of Jesus. Thank you for it, holy God. Amen. Amen. How many many of you believe God can do that and will do that? Yeah? That's that's what he wants to do, and, and he is already doing it. He is already doing it. Thank you for joining us at the Grace Honolulu YouTube channel. If you'd like to receive more sermons or content, please subscribe. And if you'd like to give, you can give at gracehonolulu.org. Have an amazing day, and we'll see you next time. God bless.